everybody in the room read Satoshi's white paper. I encourage everybody did. Awesome. You didn't? Okay, it's only nine pages. You can read it. <laughs> so this particular white paper was really just meant to be appear to be a cache system, right? And it emerged to be the prototype for all blockchains that we see today. But in its infancy, it was really Nothing new in terms of it wasn't the first virtual currency and it was also not the first cryptocurrency. It just combined the two with the cryptographic element to create an immutable ledger. So that's the unique version that Satoshi Yakamoto, if you think that he is a person, invented. So fundamentally, all the other blockchains are building on the same paradigm. And so what it really creates is a digital bearer instrument. Everybody familiar with what a bearer instrument is? Your, your cash in your pocket is a bearer instrument. If I give it to you, I don't have it anymore, and everybody knows I don't have it anymore, and you can give it to someone else. And this is what's happening in the virtual world. Typically, what the mass media gets, in my opinion, mainly wrong is they're trying to place cryptocurrencies and blockchain technology somewhere here, actually cut it out, out of, this particular graphic, trying to make it part of what they call fintech. Fintech is an entirely made up term. Right? The fintech typical examples would be PayPal. What's PayPal? It's a front end to the old banking world. It's nothing new. It's ACH. It takes three days. Right? It's really no new invention. This is a sentence I found recently in the Harvard Business Review. It's saying, blockchain will do to the financial system what the internet did to the media. I think it's actually much more than that. Right. If you think about this, internet, yeah, distributed information distribution, but what blockchain does, it's disintermediating value distribution. Value is a much, much bigger paradigm. It infects and affects every single industry on this planet, not only financial industries, but movie distribution, any rights distribution, any type of escrow service, deed, you name it, you can put it on the blockchain, right? So to put this into context, it's much better and much bigger than what the internet do, and blockchain will disrupt the internet itself. So this is an overview of the current ecosystem and current projects, and this is where you see where FinTech actually fits in. So it's this tiny box down here. So you got the big box of the obvious one, the currencies, and this is unfortunately what media is focused on right now. Everybody's talking about crypto and cryptocurrencies, but if you look at this, you got a much bigger picture here, and all of these other chains and all of these other projects might have as a side effect a currency of sorts that's being used on that blockchain, but that's not obviously its defining characteristic. It might be a developer tool, it might be used for governance, it might be used for something else, right? But to call the entire space constantly crypto and cryptocurrency is not helping the discussion moving along right now. So for everybody in the room, I find this very, very important to understand. If you're looking at these projects, don't look at them as cryptocurrency projects. Look at them as what they're actually trying to achieve, what it's being influenced. And that's not bound to a particular currency that you might be buying or trading. Look at the larger picture there. So these are the low-hanging fruits because these are the elements that are inherent in most of blockchain technology right now. So yes, you've got a currency element, but then with Ethereum, as most of you already know, obviously, uh, the smart contract system, which the most obvious application is the one up here, the crowdfunding. Most um, of the current ICOs are built on ERC-20 standards on the Ethereum blockchain. And the other elements, you see a lot of projects coming out around record keeping and around securities, obviously, which is another fallacy that you see, particularly in the United States, I'm gonna talk about it a little bit later, that people always jump to the conclusion, well, if it doesn't have a utility, it's necessarily a security. Well, it's, it's neither, right? Or it's both. But that's, again, not its defining characteristic. These were the market returns for last year. So you see what you would have made in real estate, what you would have made in gold, in US equities, global equities. And I hope most were in this particular bucket over here that are in the room here. 
So that's why in 2018, you will see a lot more money flow into the space because everybody is looking at these statistics now that hasn't allocated to the space. And you'll see in the next slide that now way more money is already getting into this game. So this was 2017. Probably most of these projects are familiar to people in the room. But um, what's interesting about these is if you look at some of the examples like teasers, they're always being reported in USD. I think it's a big mistake. They should actually list what they raised in Ether, what they raised in Bitcoin, right? Because in teasers example, if they kept most of that, which based on the lawsuit that happened over there, they actually did, this is actually $800 million right now because it's all Bitcoin and all Ether that they raised. It's not, nothing came in in US dollar, obviously. This is 2018. Already we surpassed all the amounts that were raised last year, and it's not even the end of March. I mean, obviously, Telegram is skewing this a little bit, having raised $850 million so far. But still, you will see more money flowing into the space and much more smart money in larger amounts. So this was the example that I mentioned earlier. Teasers actually raised 65,000 Ether and 361,000 in Ethereum most of which I assume they still have. If they're gonna build anything based on that, that's a different story, obviously. Uh, too much money is not necessarily a good thing. There's only so many useful exchanges right now. These are 21, the 21 uh, top exchanges make about 93% of all the trades at the moment. And as you probably know, exchanges are kind of an odd thing, and I get to that. These are just the exchanges in the United States. And you know they come with limitation. Now, as someone who wants to list their coin, they go through a check whether or not this will be considered a security. And they're not gonna list any securities. So you can't buy any of the coins that these exchanges think are securities on the exchanges in the United States. This is a checklist that you'll all have to go through if you want to buy through another exchange. So the first one being the obvious one, are you in that country? Are they excluding you a citizen if you happen to be a US citizen? Um, you should always check what are the banking relationships of those exchanges because as you probably noticed, a lot of banks dropped out of the relationship with exchanges so you can only withdraw and or interact with certain banks with certain exchanges. So if that's not a bank that you do business with, want to do business with, you probably don't want to do business with that particular exchange. You should always look for the trading volume. So I'm going to circulate this particular slide later, but it's pretty easy to find for the most part. Uh, you want to go immediately through all the verification requirements and see whether or not you can get your money and or your coins out if you need to. Because in some instances, you'll find out, okay, yeah, now the particular exchange is doing their KYC, know your client procedure, and guess what? You don't have the documents that they want and or their particular KYC procedure for whatever reason doesn't recognize your password folder or whatever that might be. I've seen everything in that space. Um, you want to know, obviously, what payment methods they accept and then also what coins are they trading. Not every exchange is trading every coin. Maybe there's a coin you're interested in that this particular exchange doesn't carry or doesn't carry the volume that you like to trade. You should check this before you even go through this entire process. The obvious one, fees, exchange rate, and reputation. Exchanges, what I mentioned earlier, are sort of an odd thing in a decentralized world because they're centralized, highly centralized, and hence also always the target of potential hacks. So this, in my personal opinion, is gonna be the future. And right now it's tiny. You see the amounts of trades that were done in the last 24 hours for these. There's about a dozen uh, decentralized exchanges right now, and these are the top four. So there's very little trading going on at this moment in time. I expect this to increase by an order of magnitude once people are getting more sophisticated in the space. So always keep an eye out for those. Also keep an eye out for those exchanges in terms of what coins are getting listed there. Uh, security, most people in the room probably have a hardware wallet, I assume or hope. If not, get one. 
Most exchanges leave most of their coins and most of their tokens uh, in cold storage, up to 99%, but on average 92%, and provide multi-signature support, hopefully. This is the very, very basic blockchain economics. Typically, I speak to crowds that are halfly comprised of people who have never even heard about Ethereum, let's say. They just heard about Bitcoin, think it's a cool thing, and want to dive into this. So we talked a little bit about uh, the utility token with a few people earlier in here. So in the past 12 months, there was this huge discussion. What is the utility? What is the utility token? The Howey test? These are all mute discussions. They, they all don't matter, in my opinion. But if you're looking to buy utility token, to some, so something that's not just a currency and not just clearly is representing an asset, what you should be looking for, does it have an immediate use case? So is the platform built? Can I immediately exchange it for a service or access? If you don't, it's actually really security for sure. Um, most tokens are created on the Ethereum blockchain. That means, well, you can't manipulate this, right? So you don't own that blockchain, you don't run the blockchain, so you're limited to whatever speed and fees there are. We'll get into this a little bit. So every transaction costs money. A lot of people that get into this game think, well, it's a virtual currency, a digital currency. I can just send this back and forth. No, there's always a cost. Not always, there will be other chains, but for the Ethereum chain, there's always a cost attached to this. And everybody in the room familiar with forks? I assume most, but not all. So the open source system, as Bitcoin and Ethereum are, develop rapidly. And in order for the network to stay consistent, people who run those nodes, run the software on their computer, need to agree on any particular update. If the majority of um, providers that run that software on our computers agree on that update, we have what's called a soft fork, everything moves smoothly. If a large descending group decides, hey, we really don't like the exchange, uh, the changes that were made to the software, we want to either keep the old software and or run an entirely different system, a fork occurs and you create a new currency as a side effect. At that point in time, you need to have the right wallet that supports the fork because you should be getting the same amount of the new coin that you already had in the old coin. So if at the Bitcoin Cash fork uh, you held any Bitcoin, you should have received the same amount of Bitcoin Cash that particular day. Gas costs. I look at this frequently and specifically every time before I give this presentation. It comes back to the fact that there's this mythos out there that inter, uh, a transaction on the blockchain happen A instantly and are free. No. You, you can look up what they cost and how long they take. So this was back in October last year. The median transaction cost was 13 cents, right? And in uh, why is this August? Oh, that was in 2017. So this is how long I've been giving this presentation. Um, in 2018, at one point in time, and I think there was a particular uh, interesting ICO happening at that point in time was 95 cents on average. That's probably something that skewed it. But still, if, if you bought something interesting that was not that ICO, you paid a lot of fees. This was yesterday, 1.2 cents. So. To me, it's somewhat of a misnomer, but it's been used in the industry, so I always like to bring it up. There's public and private blockchains. To me, the true blockchain is always decentralized and hence public. However, as we know, Ripple is now the third largest currency, is built on a private blockchain. So something to watch out for, in my opinion, the open source paradigm will always win out at the end of the day. There's this law from evolution, it's called the law of requisite variety, which means that the most flexible in a system will always end up dominating that system. It's the law of requisite variety. I'll send it here. A lot of people in this segment don't seem to understand the basic functions of money. That's why I always bring it up. And specifically, the regulators don't seem to be understanding it. And any blockchain, by definition, fulfills those criteria. It's a medium of exchange. 
It's a unit of account and a store of value. So you build a blockchain, you already have all this criteria immediately, right? They are there. And the other part that even regulators don't seem to understand, there's very limited functions of exchanging money, which is important to understand if you're contributing to an ICO. So if you were one of the first contributors to Ethereum and Ethereum set up a foundation, yes, you didn't expect anything back, right? You made a donation, that's fine. You give it to the foundation, you don't ex expect anything in return, all good. If the next person sets up a foundation, same principle seems to apply, well, no. All of a sudden, everybody saw, well, with the first donation, those people got a token back, and this token costs 35 cents. It's worth $600 at the moment. Hey, that seems like a good deal. Let's, let's reprint this model. My prediction, this model will not hold, if that makes any sense. So that's why it's important when you give money, understand there's only four ways of doing this. This is the more important test for you to do, not the Howey test. This is like, is this a loan? Are you getting it back? If not, okay, it's a donation. No, it's not a donation because you're expecting something back. Clearly, everybody can tell that. Is it a pre-sell? That's your utility token. And that's why it's important. It needs to have an immediate function. Otherwise, it's not a pre-sell, right? Then the last one is always equity. That's why the regulators actually jump on that idea of it being equity, not because of the how it is. So in the United States, it's particularly confusing because we have particular organizations that are trying to claim their rights and put their things into this particular technology. So the Commodities and Futures Trading Commission already decided it's a commodity, so you, you can buy futures now, right? Um, obviously, the IRS thinks it's property, and this will hold true for any other cryptocurrency. As a side effect, you're trading one currency for another currency, guess what? It's a taxable event. There's no software on this planet that would record this taxable event in any useful fashion right now to report it to the IRS. So it's entirely impractical. But it is what it is, so you need to know it. Um, and this is the FinCEN thing, I think I wrote about five years ago, they put out a guidance paper saying, hey, you exchange a virtual currency for a fiat currency or any other virtual currency, guess what? You're a money exchanger. And now, finally, five years later, they came across a couple of those ICOs saying, hey, by the way, you needed a money transmitter license to do that. So if you contributed to any one of those, anyone in the US, that is, they probably got a subpoena letter also from FinCEN. Ripple initially actually settled with them about three years ago. Um, the International Monetary Fund uh, decided no tokens are neither currency or money, which makes sense, and a couple of the state regulators actually now agree. So there's interesting regulation coming out of Nevada, Wyoming, and Delaware. Wyoming being the most progressive at the moment. And Montana. Thank you. So there's an overall disagreement over the legal status. Hence, when we prepare ICOs, we typically simply avoid the United States altogether. Right? And that's why also when you hear this communication, when people say, hey, uh, the government is regulating ICOs, no. The government doesn't regulate technology. They regulate citizens. So what they're actually doing is they're excluding citizens from this technology and for participating in these events. This is Bitcoin Futures. It's now listed on the largest commodity exchange, which is the one in Chicago. And this is a history of the US dollar. So this is fiat currency. As most people in the room know, it used to be packed to, the, uh, to, to gold. And then we did away with that. Then we decided in 1944, um, we make it the world's reserve currency, which is largely contested by China specifically, and which may come to an end fairly soon. Very important to know, and that's why some countries now develop their own cryptocurrencies. I think Mauritius now has their own cryptocurrency already. 
So this is the crux here because it, it's called um, fiat currency, fiat being the Latin word for let it be done. It's money by decree. And it used to say in this particular spot um, that you have to give this bearer of this note a certain amount of silver. In that same spot it now says in God we trust. So this piece is honestly one of the most interesting pieces to me that no one talks about it anymore. Ever since the Dow got hacked and 30, 35 million dollars were diverted, were actually returned. This is how the fork occurred in Ether. Most people know that, I think. Um, people stopped talking about decentralized autonomous organizations. However, I think this is the most important paradigm shift we'll see within the next five years. What, what do I mean by that? The typical example I use for this is we have right now for-profit corporations. For-profit corporations are a conundrum. You have people with entirely different interests. You've got shareholders from different interests from uh, customers, from operators, from employees. Employees just want probably get paid the most, do the little, least amount of work. Right? Shareholders want to just get the most amount of profit um, from whatever the corporation is doing. They don't care probably what the corporation is doing. So now we got scenarios where for-profit corporations make profit on a derivative. Look at Google, for example. Google says it's a search engine. It's not a search engine. It's an advertising company. They sell advertising. They derive 90-some percent of their money from advertising. If they would make a better search engine, you would click on less advertising. So just imagine a scenario where you have a for-purpose organization, and that purpose is provide a better search experience. You can still make money, but that's secondary to providing this better search experience. And you can use the same paradigm for almost every industry. This is the last and, to me, most important slide. If you're one of the few people sitting here in the room, you are one of the few people who has one of those digital wallets. To me, the digital wallet is the representation of what used to be people that had a browser, that had a mosaic browser back in 94. Today, there's three billion people that have a browser. I'm convinced there will be three or more billion people that will have digital wallets. The rising tide will lift all boats. And that's the end of my presentation.